Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia online, and thank you very much for joining us. I am Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to be here. Bernardine Evaristo is the 2019 winner of the Booker Prize for Girl, Woman, Other, which was a national bestseller and a winner and finalist for many awards, including the Women's Prize for Fiction and the Dublin Literary Award. She's the author of seven other books that explore aspects of the African diaspora. Her writing spans verse, fiction, short fiction, poetry, essays, literary criticism, and drama. She is president of the Royal Society of Literature, professor of creative writing at Brunel University, London, and an honorary fellow of St. Anne's College, Oxford. She received an OBE in 2020. Her new book is Manifesto on Never Giving Up. A review calls the book a beautiful ode to determination and daring and an intimate look at one of our finest writers. Tonight, she'll be joined in conversation with Tamala Edwards, anchor of 6ABC Action News Morning Edition. Thank you so much for being here. The screen is all yours. Thank you, Laura. And I hate COVID because I was so looking forward to getting to come to the library and meet Bernadine in person. I love Girl, Woman, Other. It is one of my all-time favorite books. So thank you for still making this happen and being with us here tonight. Well, thank you very much. And I'm just absolutely delighted to be talking to you. And, you know, the where I wanted to start was what brought you to Manifesto. I wondered if it was internal that you said all of these things I went through, everything I'm thinking about, I want to get it down so other people can see it. Because I know a huge part of your life is making the circle bigger and being there for others to, to bring diversity into literature. Or was it as you went through your life, everywhere you went, people were asking you questions and you said, OK, I'm writing the Manifesto. How did you come to this book? Yeah, well, it um, it kind of, I I think I wouldn't have written this book if I hadn't have won the booker because I had no plans to write an autobiography ever. I just thought uh, it, it's, it's too overwhelming a task trying to put your life into a book. I wouldn't know where to start um, or what to leave in, what to keep out. But when I when I won the booker, I was being interviewed literally hundreds of times all over the place and I was talking and talking about myself and as you say people were very interested in who I was and my background and, and my history as a writer and so on and um, when it came to negotiating the next book with my publisher I thought I don't want to write a novel because a novel will compete with Girl Woman Other but also and I didn't want to do that um, but also I had, you know, I'd spent many years writing Girl, Woman, Other, and by the end of it, I needed a break from writing long form fiction. Um, I didn't want to jump back into something that would be so demanding. And so I, um, I said to, to Simon, my editor, you know, I, I think I want to write a memoir, but I want to write about how I've reached this point. So it's a book which looks at um, my, you know, the history of my life, but it's looking at my creativity and how my, um, my, my, my life has been shaped by my creativity and my creativity has been shaped by my life. And so that was the origin of the book. Um, and, you know, the, the, the sort of subtitle is on never giving up. And it's interesting because that can, I think I could only have had that as a subtitle through winning the booker, because I'd reached this point where I had broken through in a, a really big way as a writer. And so then I could look back on my life and, and kind of be aware that I had never given up. And I I'd then reached this, this, what had actually been a goal for me, this point um, of kind of, you know, um, being known as a writer, selling lots of books and so on. And that's a huge point, the never giving up. I mean, in the book, you point out you have been in the arts literally since you were 11, 12 years old. And there in which you are moving between flats and you don't have a lot of money and you're just pushing, pushing, pushing. And it's, it's in your 50s, almost 60s before 
there's this huge turnaround. I think everybody likes to look and say, oh, an overnight success, or that person was always primed for this moment. And they miss the fact that it can be decades, eons, it feels like, of never giving up. That's right. That's right. Um, it was also that because I had become very well known, I, I did want people to know who I was, because I think what happens when you break through in a big way at whatever age, um, people see um, your point of arrival, but they don't know the journey you've taken to get there. And so I wanted people to know that I had been in the arts for, you know, well, all my life and that um, there had been struggle, internal, external, and that, um, you know, the, the point at which I was born, as I, in the book, I talk about my heritage. Um, I was born in a, into a culture in Britain where, um, you know, black people were um, vilified completely and utterly and, and legally vilified by white society. My, my Nigerian father, suffered that more than anyone in our family when he arrived from Nigeria in 1949. But so did my mother, my white English mother through marrying a, a black man. And then they had eight children. And, um, you know, we were growing up without much money in this area where we were kind of like the bogey family in the streets because we were the, the black family. And, you know, when I think about those origins and then that journey that I've taken to get here and how society has changed, but how, I have also, um, you know, persisted and never gave up on my creative dream because a lot of people do. A lot of people, you know, have an affinity with creativity, whatever that is, um, maybe writing, but actually they don't continue with it. Um, at some point they drop off, you know, in the course of my life, I've known lots of people who've come up with me um, or joined me along the way, and then they, they stop for, because, they can't afford to write because they're not earning enough money or, or whatever the many many reasons I guess but I never never did I just continued and it was because I it was the only thing I wanted to do I was passionate about it I believed in it um, I knew I had some talent I had so many stories that I wanted to tell and and I was just very determined that this was the life that I wanted even though as you say, I wasn't um, earning much money for most of my life. I was always moving home because I didn't have a home until very recently as in own a home. And, um, you know, I wasn't getting the sort of uh, the, those kinds of financial rewards or any kind of stability out of my creativity, but I continued to, to do it. One of the things that struck me from the book is that the message seems to be sometimes you have, if, if you don't see a thing, Toni Morrison said, if there's a book out there that you don't see that you think should be written, go, well, go write it. And it feels as though that was almost a theme in your life. Like I'm looking at my list here, you know, you're applying to dramatic schools. You don't get into some, but you don't stop. You keep going until you find one that has a community theater program. You know, when you come out, there may not be great roles for black women. You don't wait, you start your own company and create those roles. You don't wait for somebody to tell you how to write. You start teaching yourself over and over again. I, I feel like in life, a lot of us wait for the gatekeeper to say, you can do this. And instead mm -hmm. you kept poking till you found the loose bit of fence and said, I'm coming through. And that seemed to be one of the messages as well. If you don't see it, create it for yourself. Absolutely. And of course, Toni Morrison, was a huge inspiration to me. African-American women writers were a huge inspiration to me when I was a young woman, um, a young black feminist who was working in theater and um, looking for role models. And there really weren't any in the UK at that time. Um, I won't go into the history of the UK, but it was just, you know, the, the, the black women who were writing in fairly large numbers and publishing in the world were African-American women writers. There were some African women writers like Gucci Machetta mm -hmm. from Nigeria, who, you know, she wrote 20 novels or so, and she lived in Britain for a long time. Um, but, but really the sort of, the, the, the huge inspiration were the African-Americans. And, and Toni Morrison for me was the, the one who, um, whose work I love more than anyone else's. And, and for the, her whole body of work, I'm a huge fan of hers. And so I got a book, um, which I've still got called Black Women Writers at Work. 
and it was published in the 80s and uh, I can't remember who the editor was but she interviewed Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, I think Gloria Naylor, Audrey Lord, you know that wow. generation of writers yeah it was great and it was they were being interviewed so it was an in a book where they were being interviewed which you don't really see much these days you know with anthologies people might write essays or memoir pieces but they're not being interviewed so they were interviewed so the the the, the interviewer is asking them questions and they're answering and you know reading someone like Toni Morrison who would be saying things like that you know I remember her saying um trying to write is like lighting a candle in a gale force wind. And that kind of struck with me because she was saying it was hard. You know, she was saying it's, you know, you have to marshal your resources to honor your creativity. So, so, and, and of course she was also saying, as you said, you've got to write these books, but they were all saying that, you know, Alice Walker was saying that, Audrey Lord was saying that and she she came to London and we used to hang out with her in the 80s because um you know she was she was phenomenal and also also incredibly inspirational role model so um they were the people who gave me um they gave me permission to write without meeting most of the time not really meeting me directly but because they were doing it I felt that I could do it and if they hadn't have been doing it I think it would have been harder for me to begin my career as a theatre maker and a writer. But um, when I think about my father, he came to Britain in 1949 from Nigeria, faced the front line of racism, but he became a community activist and a local labour councillor um, by the 70s. That's what he was doing. So he was somebody who had been, you know, discriminated against and oppressed by the colonial motherland when he arrived here and and it's certainly in the early years and yet he was somebody who said I'm going to change this society um, from within I'm going to get stuck in he was a socialist and a labor counselor so he was there helping the working classes of all colors to to improve their lives so I also inherited that um, when I left drama school, absolutely, there was no work for us. Absolutely, there was no work for us. Um, I know African Americans have, you have your own history, and I know things have been a very unequal and, and opportunities, you know, we, we, we all know a lot about African Americans, but comparing it to Britain, um, there, there is no comparison really. So, so there was no theatre by or about black women when I graduated from drum school. And there were very few opportunities for us to act because nobody wanted to employ us. So what do you do? Well, we formed our own theater company. Um, so it was absolute, we were absolutely being the change we wanted to see. And, and that was also part of my foundation as a theater, as a, a creative person, theater maker, and then a, and a novelist, writer, and poet, which I've, continue to do through to this day and then that has also led to my activism um, you know setting up inclusivity initiatives so that more people of color in particular and under people from underrepresented communities are given opportunities to um, to participate in in the arts there's a chapter in the book that you dedicate to relationships and you know, late in the book, you say, if you're wise, you find a partner who supports your work, but if you can tell somebody doesn't, you get away from them. And as an example, you talk about someone you meet when you're in your mid twenties. Um, it's an older woman who seems taken with you at first and then is a nightmare. And you call her TMD, the mental dominatrix. And she takes over your life for almost five years. And you've got crazy stories in the book of where this goes. And I wanted to talk to you about that because I think a lot of people struggle with that, which is there's somebody in their world who's saying, it's hard enough to talk to yourself, but then there's somebody else saying, you can't do it, or it should be this way. And your persona, at least in this book, was so strong. It was hard for me to imagine you going through this for five years, and yet you did. And I think there are a lot of people out there who would want to hear about what that was like and the strength it took to move away from it and not let your creative life be taken. Well, yeah. So, so in my twenties, I, I had relationships with men up until my early sort of late teens, early, very early twenties. And then I um, had relationships with women in my twenties. And then I went back to having relationships with men. And so this was the last relationship I had with a woman and it, it did last 10, um, ten years. it lasted five years. It felt like 10 years. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it did. And, you know, after I left it, after I'd sort of come back to my senses, I, I did not understand why I had stayed in that relationship. And I think it was, you know, we would now say that it was a coercively controlling relationship, but that terminology wasn't around then. Um, you know, I don't think I don't think Oprah was around then doing her show in the mid 80s. You know what I mean? So we weren't having these conversations that we have now and that are there in the media where you're analyzing yourself and your relationships and, you know, people are ex exploring, um, you know, the, their sort of their lives in a very open way that is then very educational for everyone else and also maybe very relatable. So I think it was probably easier back then to get stuck in a relationship and not really understand what was happening, not have, not have an understanding of the, you know, not being able to detect the warning signs and not having anywhere to go where there was some kind of analysis of it, you know, through through people talking about it. Because as I say, those conversations were, I think those conversations started to happen in a big way in the 90s, but in the 80s, they didn't. So I had been this very strong, feisty black woman, feminist, you know, very much part of a sort of a women's community. And really, when I think about my younger self at that age in my early 20s, very, very strong. But then I fell into this toxic relationship, which I didn't think was toxic until I was kind of trapped in it. And I think if I'd have stayed in that relationship, I would have stopped writing eventually. And I eventually left it. And it was, you know, mildly violent as well on her part. Um, so I left that relationship and it took me years to find myself again. I, um, I, I, I rented a flat. I lived on my own. I lived on my own until I met my husband in 2006. So that was like 1990 to 2006, I was living on my own. And for a lot of that time, well, some of that time I was recovering from this relationship. I needed to find myself again. I needed to find my voice because I'd lost my voice. Um, and it, it did take a long time. You, you know, I really had to, to work on it. And I went and did all these personal development courses, which helped. And um, once I found myself, then I became the person you see before you today, you know, because I then found my power and realized that I'd lost my power. I'd given away my power and I was never going to do that again. And I haven't done that ever since. And I would never do it now. That was something I had to go through. But actually, because in the book, I look at everything through a sort of very positive um, perspective. I, see, I even see that relationship as positive because it made me so powerful in, you know, in going forwards because I was not going to get trapped again. And, and I realized what I'd lost and I was never going to lose myself again. And I never have done. So it was actually, you know, it was something I needed to go through. But I extract, I extract, um, you know, good things from it. In fact, in the book, you say a lot of times the people who are having the struggles are the people who rise to the top because you need that struggle to push you on later. Yeah. I, you know, you at various points, um, a lot of people can have trouble changing course. So let's say you put all that time into the theater. Somebody might say, well, you know, look, I've been doing theater for eight, nine years. I can't stop now and start writing poetry. Wait, I've been writing poetry. I've got two or three books now. I can't stop now and start doing prose. I wanted you to talk about two things, the ability and courage to do that, to say, okay, I'm, I'm striking out in a new direction to not get stuck in inertia, but also your process. It's not like you said on Monday, I'm going to leave theater and write poetry it's a process and there are things that you did to get there and so I, I thought it would be helpful to people to hear about finding the courage to make that change and then how you put it into action it didn't feel like courage actually it was it was just the process that I went through so I began writing um the, writing for theatre that's how I began writing when I was at drama school but my plays always came out as poetry and um, and that was experimental theatre and I was very influenced by Intozaki Shange's For Colour Girls Who mm -hmm. Consider Suicide and the Rainbow was enough amazing still an amazing book I still love the poetry in that and um, which came to London in the late 70s and so I I, I was I, I wanted to rebel against the system um, and 
I um, did not see myself as part of British theatre tradition. So I was doing something different. And, um, and then I left theatre behind and wrote poetry. And actually my first book, Island of Abraham, I think I was kind of um, trying to write poetry that I thought would be sort of acceptable to the poetry world as it existed then in Britain, the mainstream poetry world. I hadn't found my voice. And when I look back on that uh, book, I, I was exploring things about the African diaspora, African history and stuff that was all very interesting. But my poetic style was very restrained. And I think I just, I was struggling to, to find my voice, as simple as that. And then when I wrote my book, Lara, I did find my voice and that's a book about my family history and it's a verse novel. But actually I spent three years working on it as a prose novel and it didn't work, threw it away literally in the bin and then transformed it into a verse novel. Although I didn't call it a verse novel when I was working on it, I was thinking of it as a narrative poem. But when it came to publishing it, my publisher said, let's call it a verse novel because it will sit in the fiction shelves of bookshops and so it'll have more of a chance of, of, of selling. And so that's what it did. Um, so that was, um, you know, that was a strategic um, retitling of the book in order to make it more marketable. Um, but the book's the same, you know, the poetry, the, the language, everything about the book hasn't changed, but, but we had to kind of, um, yeah, um, you know, make it more palatable because poetry, you know, there's a problem with poetry selling in general in, Britain. Um, so yeah, and, and then with each book I was exploring, you know, what I was wanting to explore through about the African diaspora, but I was ex ex experimenting with form. <clears throat> and like you were saying, courageous, I think it was more like um, kind of desperation really, because I was so desperate to get in the zone with whatever I was writing, to believe in it, to feel that it was working that if it wasn't working, and sometimes it would take me a very long time to discover something wasn't working like years, but if it wasn't working, I couldn't rest until I'd made it work. And so that sometimes meant changing the form. And, but also I gave myself the freedom to do that because I, I knew that <clears throat> I was going against the sort of <clears throat> conventions as a writer because all the writers I know, they start their books in one form and they end it in that form. You know, they start a novel and they finish the novel and it's a novel, whereas I, I'm just constantly changing and experimenting um, because I have got that um, drive to um, just to, to, do, to do things that are different, to be unconventional. Um, and that's rooted in my, in my background, you know, growing up in a very unorthodox household with a mother who was determined to be unconventional and the father who was also bucking against the system. And I think that's in my DNA. And then that has, <clears throat> <coughs> excuse me, carried through to my, with my writing. Um, if I had started writing Lara as a novel, a prose novel, which I did, and I worked in it for three years and it worked, I might never have become an experimental writer because mm -hmm. if I would have be, been very comfortable with having written a, a traditional verse novel, but um, sorry, a traditional prose novel, but it didn't work. And so I was kind of like forced to try another route with it. And um, yeah, and I teach creative writing and like with my students, I'm always encouraging them to switch things up because it may be that the form they're, they're writing something in needs to be told in another form. And I think it's about also being committed to being creatively adventurous and free and yeah, and, and just doing my own thing. And I mean, it was no small thing with Lara. I think that was the book where you get there and then you rubbish the whole thing and restart writing it as verse. And then it starts to click. But the idea of taking three years worth of work and tossing it out, I think a yeah. lot of people would be stuck in that moment and, and not be willing to listen to themselves to try it a different way. That's right. But I took a long time to reach the point where I threw it away. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, that was, it's very interesting writing the book because I was, I thought, my God, you really stick at things, don't you? Even though it was not working, I'm still plowing away with it and trying to force it to be something that it's just not going to be. And then after three years with Lara, I was like, no, it's just not going to work. And there's also my book, Soul Tourists. You know, I wrote, um, 
I wrote uh, 90,000 words of a novel and I'd never written such um, so many words in my life. And then it, it, again, it wasn't working. So I had to switch it up, but I spent years on it before I switched it up. Um, and there was a book I wrote before the um, two, two books before Go Woman Other. I spent a couple of years in a book and wrote 40,000 words. And it, it, again, it wasn't working. So I turned it into, 6, 000, into a 6,000 word short story and then wrote the book I was meant to write all along. So it's, I, and that's also partly why I wrote this book because I wanted to people to see my process because I think my process is interesting <laughs> because I'm not sure that other people go through all of this kind of convoluted stuff in order to get their work out there. Um, and I think for writers who are struggling, uh, I hope they find it inspiring. Um, and, get, and I hope the book, you know, that part of the book where I'm talking about my, um, my writing process, I hope, that people who are writing take inspiration from it, that sometimes it does take a long time to write a book. Sometimes you do have to get rid of something, even though um, it's gonna kill you because you've just devoted years of your life to it. But sometimes you do have to, as we say, murder your darlings. Mm. Um, and, and that you, you need to stay true to yourself and, and true to your creative impulses. And if you don't know what they are, keep doing the writing because you will discover what they are eventually. It's interesting that you end in that place that because it seems as though a lot of what you were able to accomplish was because you held on to your authenticity. You were willing to hear your own voice, even though, as you point out in the book, there were lots of points through your life. Your parents were unconventional, but even from the very beginning, there were white people saying crazy things to you. There were black people telling you you're not being black the right way. You need to do it differently. Um, you know, there's not a lot of angst in the book when you are living life as a gay woman. As you say, I didn't waste any time in the closet. You embraced your life. You embraced your life as a straight woman. Um, you don't waste a lot of time on age. You, you know, say, I'm glad I did success didn't come when I was younger. It's almost as if, and I wrote in the margins of the book, she refuses to be made small. And Ooh. You know, which that's what struck me is that in every aspect of your life, and that's part of hearing your voice is refusing to see to other people what that voice should say. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a really interesting observation. Um, I, uh, yeah, you know, when you write a book and you think you've done one thing and then people offer you their insights into it and you think, oh yeah, that's true. You know, somebody was interviewing me the other day and they were saying, you know, it's really interesting how you write about gender violence. I was like, really? And then I was thinking, oh yeah, I do, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's there, it's there in my work and I, but I'm not really consciously intending to do that, but that is, it is part of our lives, right? So it's gonna come out. Um, but refusing to be made small, I mean, I think as I've got older, I would definitely say that I, um, yeah, I, um, I have become really very powerful, you know, very, very, very powerful. And um, I mean, I'm not talking about powerful in the world at large, I'm just talking about powerful in myself. But I have also always been a very strong person. Um, and, you know, I, I am half Nigerian and Nigerians are pretty powerful people. <laughs> and I have to say, I have to say, um, and <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I was mentioned the personal development courses, which not a lot of people were doing then in the 90s. But that was all about, you know, accepting yourself, going for what you want, believing in yourself, not spending time with people who are going to bring you down um, and that's something you know I think that's something you touched on earlier people you know the naysayers who um will tell you that you can't do what whatever it is you want to do and my solution to that was not to tell them what I was going to do <laughs> still today you know I kind of hold my vision and dreams very close to me because if I tell people they're going to tell me why it's not going to work um if I'm starting work on a novel and I tell you know not so much today because I'm so kind of strong in what I'm doing. But years ago, you know, I would tell people what I'm working on and they would say, oh, no, no, I don't think that's a good idea. And, and if you're not strong, you can be easily crushed by that. And these are people who hadn't even read the work. They're just responding to how you're describing this, this thing that you're working on. So I think in order to be to develop your power, 
you need to be really alert to the people around you who are going to diminish you in some way um, and, and spend time with people who won't do that. And um, yeah, so that's almost like that's personal development 101. You know, <clears throat> get rid of those people if you can. Not Sometimes it's hard. You know, they may be in your family or whatever, but try and get rid of those people who won't let you be the great person that you're meant to be. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and I, but I think I also wondered about it on a fundamental level because it's no small thing, you know, when you write about your childhood and, and White Woolwich, you call it, and, in that house with seven other kids and two parents and the world, as you point out, at that time, it, the message to Black people and to a Black woman is there's no space for you here. Mm -hmm. And that is not a minor thing. And, and I think people from various communities continue to hear that and continue to feel that. And wondering about your ability, I mean, because people often will go, well, since that person in that part of the world says I don't have much to say, well, then I just won't say anything. And what it mm -hmm. takes to push past that. I think there are a lot of people who may be listening in who there's some reason why they're being told, well, your voice doesn't really count here. There's not a place for you. And yet that middle child, you push your brothers aside and from the very beginning, you make your voice heard. And I wondered where you found that fortitude. That's, that's really hard to answer. I think actually, I think being a middle child from the little bit of pop psychology that I know means that you are more independent because you know you are the you are the child, child or in my case because eight children you know there are two of us who are in the middle and we're both incredibly independent um so so the older children had responsibilities and also they were the first so they were their you know our parents darlings when they were born because they're the first children and then the younger ones are cute when you're a middle <laughs> child you're kind of you know, and my siblings, they're very cute. My little sibling, you know, my, my younger siblings, extremely cute little kids. And, and there's me in the middle. And I think I was left to my own resources and, and, and I became a reader. I mean, I, I don't know how much my siblings read. I think they did, but I was definitely the one for sure who was really, um, you know, really loved reading. That was that was my entertainment. It was my escape. It was my travel because we didn't travel anywhere. We didn't have any money. We didn't really have holidays and stuff. Um, and and then the then the youth theatre um, is where I learned to be self expressed and to discover my creativity at the age of twelve. And so that also played a part because when you're performing, you are proclaiming yourself to the world. You know, you are. Um, you know, you have a very, you can have a very powerful identity as a performer. Um, it, it can be a very brave, and that can be a very brave and courageous thing to do, but you also get approval from people around you, um, which is, can be intoxicating. And then I went on a very, uh, on a course, which is a very political feminist course to study theatre, where I was taught by very powerful women in theatre. Um, and so all of these factors, you know, I think have, been the ingredients um, which have made me the person I've become, you know, but that doesn't mean that I don't have my vulnerabilities. And obviously I spent that five year period where I, I lost my voice and kind of lost myself. And in certain situations, I can be somebody who is not particularly powerful um, and not, not so much now, now that, you know, I, I sort of the last few years, I think, um, a friend of mine um, who's just a bit younger than me, she said she's in her what she calls her. Can I swear here? I think Is so. It okay to swear. I think okay. so. Okay, she's in her she's in her fuck it fifties, right? That's <laughs> me what she too. Said. She's an actress. She, yeah, she's an actress. She's in Bridgerton. If any, if you're watching that, and um, I'm in my fuck it fifties. It's like she's just not putting up with anything, you know. And um, I kind of think, yeah, and I'm in my sod it sixties. I don't know if sod it is a is an expression in America. Um, I think we can figure out um, what you mean. Yeah, yeah. And I'm in my sod it's so not as good as fuck it fifties, but it's like saying I, you know, I'm just not putting up with this stuff because we have to put up with this stuff in a sense in this society, you know. You know, when you're a a, 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 a woman of color in a majority white society and you're minoritized on account of your color, 
and on account of your gender and on account of your class, you know, you are putting up with stuff, you're breathing it every, every day of your life in a sense. So you have to be so strong to, to be who you want to be in that kind of society, because it's still a patriarchal society that we're living in in this country and, and in America and so on. Not, not the patriarchal society of my childhood, but it's still very patriarchal. It's very white. Um, you know, I am, a, I am a professor in a university and I'm one of 30, about 30, I think it might be less. And that is three zero, 30 professors, uh, black woman professors out of 17,000 professors in this country and a professor in Britain is the top tier of academia. So we have like lecturers and senior lecturers and readers, associate professors, we've got professors at the top and there are 17,000 of them and there are under 30 black women, right? That's shocking. But it is just unbelievable. It's totally unbelievable. And that's why in this country, racism has become more of a conversation um, through the Black Lives Matter movement about racism in this country. Because in Britain, we're very, very, very um, comfortable talking about racism in America. Um, but actually dealing with racism in Britain is something that, you know, you kind of, um, you have to sort of drag people screaming to have those conversations. Um, but it's when you see the statistics that you realize the, the enormity of the task ahead. Um, I mean, I love this country, London, you know, it's, it's a very beautiful multicultural place, but of course there are lots of systemic issues here. But this is, this is what we're dealing with um, in this country as well as in America um, as, as women of color. And so you've just got to have survival strategies um, to deal with that. And I have my survival strategies. You know, when I read that, you know, you're the president-elect of the Royal Society of Literature and the first person of color to hold the role since 1820, I, I was just like, I'm happy for her, but she must just be like, this is ridiculous. Yes. Well, 1820, I mean, the Black history of Britain goes back thousand, a couple of thousand years, yes. right? It does. We won't go into that, but, but there weren't that many pe Black people eligible in the 19th century. But certainly in the, in the last sort of 30, 40 years, there, there should have been. But also, but, but, but more than that, I am the first president. I'm the second woman. So Dame Marina Warner is the, uh, was the president um, just before me. So I am the first president who did not go to Oxford University or Cambridge University or Eton. Now, I don't know if you know Eton. I know Eton. Which is... You know Eton, right, which yeah. is probably the most famous public school in the world, and it's produced 20 British prime ministers. So I'm the first one who didn't go to one of those three institutions in 200, over 200 years. <laughs> those are not the only talented people in the world. Like how many people should be at the table who have so, so much So many learn. people could have been president, right? So many people could have been president. But we're glad but, you're there. Yes, um, and it is a progressive organization now, I have to say. It's not, it's not a fusty old institution. It is really dynamic and progressive. And that's why I took, I took on the role. Um, I wouldn't have done if it was really old fashioned and establishment. And I'm sure in 2026, when you step down, it will be a whole different world. There are a couple of <laughs> things from the book that I wanted to bring up. Your father is a huge character at various points. And you know, when your mother meets him, you know, she says, why did she fall in love with him? Because he was so charming. And you talk about him at the Christians at the Catholic Society, and he's just charming. And he's this uh, union steward at his shop. There's this whole persona, but he's a terror at home. And when you're a kid, you have a hard time with him. Yet when you're an adult, you have a very different relationship. And I wondered how you reconcile these two sides of him, that he was one way when he was in that house with you and very different in the world at large? Nobody's ever asked me this. Interesting question. Ooh, we think about it. Um, so eight children's a lot yeah. <laughs> to cope with. And my mother's never said that my father didn't want eight children, but she definitely did. You know, she was an only child and she wanted lots of children. She loved being a mother. She had eight children in 10 years. She was just oh pregnant gosh. for 10 years. I know, I know, it was crazy. Um, she absolutely loved it. Um, 
but you can imagine what the house was like. I mean, I don't know, you've got children, haven't you? But I don't know how many. Two, but... and I, there's not a room for <laughs> nobody else in here. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. So can you imagine eight? So, and he's a man and he's coming from Nigeria. He's coming from a society where, um, which is, you know, patriarchal society where, um, you know, especially he was born in 1929. So, you know, very old fashioned views about women and raising families and so on. But he did contribute, you know, he had to in a way, he had no choice because we didn't have, we had no money, there was nobody else to help. So and my father, when we were very young, had to help my mother raise us and, and, and feed us and wash us and the rest of it. But I wonder, but, but he did, you know, he, he, was, he was home quite a lot, but he didn't communicate with us. He didn't talk to us. He literally did not talk to us unless it was to tell us off. And he used to go down to the Catholic club, you know, maybe two or three times a week. So he was out of the house in the evenings, um, you know, a number of evenings in the week. And um, I just wonder if, you know, having had this big family, which for a Nigerian man is a big thing, you know, it's a sign of your virility and masculinity to be able to produce all these children. Um, but maybe he, maybe he really didn't like the reality of it. Maybe he wasn't suited to the reality of it. And coming from a culture where children were seen and not heard, very, very different and bringing that to Britain as he would do um, long before Oprah and uh, those, those programs and so on. So, um, so maybe that was it, that he didn't know how to relate to us and he didn't, you know, he wasn't interested. He was doing what he, what was expected. Or, you know, he was doing something that gave him status, but maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't in his heart because he wasn't, he wasn't a hands-on father in the sense of communicating with us. Um, yeah. And yet he was, it seems so it was different when he, when you got to be an adult, maybe he, that was the point at which he could, he could connect. And, you know, you talk in your early writing, you set out to connect and find your black ancestors. And over time, especially with Lara, as you revise the book, it's a journey to connect with your white ancestors. And it's something at the end of the book, you thank your ancestors, all of them, and realize that they all have a piece of you, that there's their sort of resilience is within you. And I thought that that was interesting that you, that that was a journey you had to take to say, I can lay claim to them too. They are just as important and a part of me. That's right. I, it's, it, it all seems a bit ridiculous to me now, but you know, my book, Lara, which was first published in 97, and then I added new material um, about 10 years later, it's a fictionalized version of my family history. And um, I write about my parents' childhood. I write about the, what they knew about their parents. I write, and I go deeper into their ancestry. And I look at my childhood in the 60s and 70s growing up mixed race. And um, I, I, I struggled to write my, to fictionalize my grandmother who was at this point dead, but she was somebody I'd known up until the age of 26. She was very much in my life, but I really struggled to fictionalize her because she was white <laughs> and my mother because she was white. And that's just weird because these are people that I knew, but there was this barrier because I had grown up in this very white, no, actually, I don't think I struggled with my mother so much, but I'd grown up in this really white society, you know, the only black family in the area for a long time. Um, and then I discovered black culture, black society, and, and very much identified as black and was writing from a black perspective for mm, 10, about 10 years. And then I start writing um, about my family history and I'm having to write white characters, which is half of my family. And I'm struggling with the whiteness of it, which, which is just, yeah, I, I don't really get it. It's almost like I was, um, yeah, the, 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 their whiteness became a barrier. But of course I got through it, especially my grandmother, because I knew her. But there was a, a point at which I just thought, I don't know how to do this. And of course, as a writer, what you do with your fictional characters is you connect to their humanity or you create their humanity or connect to it. And that's what I did with my grandmother. I tried to understand who she was, she was racist, um, but she also loved us. And so I was able to write 
her, a version of her, um, exploring that and why she objected to my parents' marriage so vehemently as she did and so on. Um, and uh, I don't have a problem with it now, but but there was a period when I did. Um, and, and I kind of imagine that, uh, that's why I understand sometimes when white people can't write black characters, um, because they, they, they're, to them there's this barrier of color and maybe, maybe culture, although it's not always culture. And um, because I was there myself, but, it, but, but in the opposite direction. And that's interesting, your journey with your grandmother, because in the book, that's something you talk about, the forgiveness of yourself and others, that people are complex and they change. And I think often mm -hmm. in the world, people want people to be sort of stuck in amber and you're willing to step back and look at them from various different sides. Um, to look at your grandmother's attitude, it was terrible, but she had invested so much in your mother that she had a different dream. And this was a shattering of the dream, but that takes a largeness to be able to see her in that complexity. But also researching my grandmother, I understood my grandmother by the time I'd finished writing about her in, in, in Lara, her section in Lara, because she came from a really poor working class family. And I understood then at the turn of the 20th century, why would you not want to aspire to be middle class? And of course, being middle class meant my mother marrying a doctor or somebody and black people didn't come into it. They were not part of the equation then in my grandmother's consciousness. And so the, the shock and horror for my grandmother of a black man turning up when she had this dream that my, my, my mother would move up the social ladder um, and away from the poverty and hardship um, and early death and you know the rest of it, um, poor health of her generation. So I understood it. And so I think, I actually think, and this is something I've thought quite recently, that writing fiction for me and, and having to connect to my character's humanity which means you have to write them from a compassionate place compassionate place but also try and cr create complexity otherwise they're two-dimensional not realistic I think that has probably made changed how I see people and um, at this point has made me more compassionate as a person <laughs> than I was when I was 21 and everything was very cut and dried. You know, you are good and you are bad. I don't wanna know you, but I do want to know you. You know, it was very clear, very cut and dried. And I know that can be the case for younger people, right? But now as a writer, it's all about the complexities. So I think I have become more compassionate. Um, In the book. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. In the book, towards the end, you get into what people would call cultural appropriation. And you say, you've got to be careful, but why, you know, we, we have to let people be able to walk into different worlds because what does that do to art if we say only these people can write about these things in these ways? And that's a big debate, Bernadine. Um, you know, yeah. there are people who get very angry. And I like the fact that you took a stand and said, let's think about this. I... I, I find this argument really frustrating. And I didn't use the term cultural appropriation because I didn't want that to hijack the whole book. Because what happens um, is when I kind of, when I'm interviewed, that the, the not, not you, by the way, this is an amazing interview, but what happens is, um, this is for the media, the papers and stuff, mm -hmm. they tend to, um, they try to um, uh, uh, use topical issues right um tag topical issues onto the interview and and then the interview and the headline becomes about this topical issue right so i knew that if i went too deep into cultural appropriation and if i called it cultural appropriation that that would be that would hijack the whole book in a way and i didn't want that to happen and it hasn't happened which i'm really pleased about so i call it cultural ownership right, right. um so, so this, this is the thing, I don't know how it plays out in America, but there are people in the UK who think that if you are a white writer, you shouldn't write black characters, right? Because that is cultural appropriation. Mm. Okay, so what they're saying to white writers is to not to write integrated novels because 
they don't have the right to, to write black experiences, right? So what they're saying is they should be um, excluded from novels by white people. Fundamentally, that's what they're saying. But these people do not carry this argument into screen drama, right? So when we're watching screen drama, television series, films, often, usually these days, pretty multicultural, nobody's looking to see who has written those scripts. And nobody is demanding that the people who write the black characters in a film should be black. The writer, script writers should be black. When they write the um, Asian characters, the script writers should be Asian. The working class characters, they should be working class. Queer characters, they should be queer. We know that's impractical, it's nonsense, it's rubbish, right? So I don't understand this argument, which is about limiting um, the possibilities of everyone's creativity. And as you say, you know, everyone should, well, I believe everyone should have the right to be able to walk in other people's shoes. But, and I do say this in the book, and I can't go into it in great depth because I haven't got time, but there are consequences to it. And there are, there are the, there's the power system around our creativity. Who gets promoted? I mean, I think about the help, right? Mm -hmm. And all the arguments around that. I mean, she had every right, you know, some people say questionably, morally questionable, but anyway, you know, she chose to write that book, but there is there are going to be responses to it that are going to challenge that representation in that book and also the context of that book and also how that book was promoted. So I think it's really complicated. But I think this I think it's really simplistic to say that you cannot do it because it's just not practical. And let's not talk about hairstyles. <laughs> I agree with you. Nobody owns flats. Nobody <laughs> owns flats. <laughs> um, in the book, you talk about a criticism that you get that is echoes of Toni Morrison of, you know, why are you writing about Black people and centering them? And it took me to Girl, Woman, Other, where sometimes you have to see a thing to understand its power. Um, and in reading that book, seeing those characters, seeing those women, and it wasn't some big drama, oh, these are Black women. It was just the humanity, the stories. And it was, Bernadine, I'm at a loss for words almost in that you really got at the human story is the center of the story. And that when people say, well, why are you putting that person in the center? They're missing the fact that everyone's a keyhole, everyone's that doorway. And what a powerful set of doorways those 12 stories are. You know, that there is this kind of um, ridiculous um, sort of, it's a kind of, um, I don't know, sort of um, understanding that white stories are universal and black stories or Asian stories or whatever minority group stories are not, right? As if, as if somehow we are divorced from the humanity of whiteness. So a black story is about black people, but white stories have a universality which can be, you know, can reach anybody and everybody. And it's utter nonsense. But it's also one of the reasons why it's been so hard for writers of color to be published in the UK, because publishers look at these stories that have been put before them over the years. It's changed now in the last few years, but for decades, they would say, oh no, there's nobody's interested in this. There's no market for it. So they would see the blackness of the stories, whatever that would be, but they wouldn't see the humanity of the characters. And they would somehow think that black British stories are only for black British readers. And they would say, but black British people don't read books, which is nonsense as well. So you've had a lot of nonsense ar around this whole issue. But essentially, a good story is a good story. And people will, you know, find points of connection with it. Even though I talk about the fact that I didn't, there weren't black writers writing when I was a child that I had any access to. So all the stories were white. I still connected to the stories. You know, I became a writer partly because I was a reader first. 
you know, and I absolutely huge advocate for people of color in, in, in children's fiction, of course. And there has been a huge absence of this in the UK. But even so, I connected to the humanity of the stories that I was reading. So it's, you know, these are just some of the issues that we have to grapple with. Um, yeah. But do you understand the power of what you did? The fullness of those characters is such, it's almost like falling through water. You stop, you, you forget to think about race, you forget to think about these other things and you just are so taken with them and identifying with them that the rest almost recedes. And it's, it, so it's a, yeah, it's a magic trick and it's an earthquake and I don't think I'd seen anybody do it before. Wow. Wow, that's, that's really good to hear. I think, you know, I was very specific about their cultural backgrounds though. Um, so that's really interesting to hear because and nobody's quite put it that way to me before because, you know, they all, in Britain, um, well, I know in America as well, but, but black people in Britain don't have a shared history in this country. Um, you know, we come from the 50 odd African countries, 30 odd Caribbean countries, and, and sometimes from other places in the world. So we don't have 400 years of a shared history in this country. So it's, we're very specific in our cultural backgrounds. So I really, I, I, I kind of planned it, you know, I wanted people of African origin, and I wanted people of um, Caribbean origin. And some people were migrants and some people are first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, very true to who we are. But I was thinking, you know, I was very, very specific about that. But if all of that kind of melted away ultimately, and you were just connecting to them as human beings, then, you know, that's great, um, I think. Yeah. No, but I think what it was is all that. of that was in there. And we're so used to being told that the more you see someone as Black or African or Caribbean or whatever, that pushes them away. The way you did that book, it was the fulsomeness of it. You completely saw their of colorness. And you completely saw it in their humanity. You saw yourself in them, no matter who mm. you were as a reader. And that was the beautiful thing. Yeah, that's this is what people say to me. I've had like old white men in their 80s coming up to me and telling me they relate to parts of the book. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> we're, know, getting, so, yes. we're getting towards the that. end. We're getting towards the end. And there are two things I wanted to get in real quick before we go. One of the things that struck me is towards the end, as you decide, you know, I want to be a writer, you dream about the booker, but you're, you're going through it and you're trying to network and trying to make it happen. You have that experience that I'm sure so many people in creative life have, which is you see the person to the left of you getting the big write up. You see the person to the right of you winning an award. And you really put a lot of energy into being positive and listening to your affirmations actively being happy for them, not getting lost in jealousy. This is such a huge part of creative life that I thought you should definitely say a word about that because how many people out there are saying, when is it going to be my turn? Yeah, I mean, as you say, I, I put a lot of energy into being actively happy for them. So I had to work at it. You know, I had to work at you know, not being jealous, not being envious, but wanting to celebrate their success, because I also understood that I probably wouldn't get it if I didn't, if I wasn't generous myself, you know, I, do, I think being mean can backfire and you close off all possibilities. And so, um, but it was a struggle and it was a struggle for decades actually, because I was, I had my body of work and I was doing something nobody else was doing and I was getting mm -hmm. very good reviews, but I wasn't breaking through. And, and it was, you know, that was kind of, I suppose it was painful for me. So I was always working on being positive. And even though I might be having mean thoughts about people, <laughs> trying, of course, because I'm human, but trying to turn that around. And um, I think I say something like turning acts of, turning jealousy into acts of generosity, mm. you know? So it's even, even like obviously celebrating somebody's success. And even just through doing that, it's not being false, but I think you're just creating a really positive thing out of a feeling that may not be so positive that you're, you don't really want to have, have hanging around, you know? And, um, and I've seen people broken by jealousy and envy. 
and, and, and destroyed, their creativity destroyed. And so it's something that comparison is just awful. You know, we have to stop comparing ourselves to other people. We have our own path that we're gonna take or we're taking. So, um, so people have to find a way to deal with it and to turn it around because it will eat them up and um, nobody else is gonna suffer except yourself. So <laughs> it's, it's a good one to remember. Comparison is the thief of joy. And at the end, you talk about, you didn't just open the door for yourself and be excited that you made it through. You actively did things. You, you know, were part of the free verse report showing how few black poets were getting attention in England. You are currently involved in getting the works of black writers published. You created, I'm looking for the, the Brunel Poetry Prize at your college, which I think is the largest paid prize, which is highlighting writers of color. You've done everything you can. Um, you know, what is the, the old saying from, uh, oh, was it Audre Lorde? Uh, I don't think it was. If you know, if love is not being served at the table, you've got to get up and go elsewhere. I'm paraphrasing. You have created a table for others where love is being served. And I wanted you to talk about that because that is a choice not to just say, I want for me, but I want for us. Yes. Yes. And it's, you know, I, um, I, this is something I've been doing. I mean, I think it really began with Theatre of Black Women, which, you know, three of us formed when we left drama school. You could say today, looking at it today, you could say it was an activist theatre company because we were creating a space for black women in theatre where none existed. And it's something that has continued with my career in tandem with my writing. And I, I, and I was talking about my parents and they were both community, my father in particular, they were very, he's very much a community activist. So it was something I grew up with. And it's, it, um, it's something I believe in, that we are all part of, we share an ecosystem and we need to support each other and we're interdependent. And if you have um, privileges and opportunities yourself, then why wouldn't you try and bring other people along why wouldn't you share it why wouldn't you try and create opportunities so these things that I have initiated and been behind and so on are things that I have um, carried out along with my creativity and my creativity hasn't suffered as a result in any way you know my creativity is my priority but but also my community or communities are also my priority and so it's just something that has been part of my life for a very long time. I'm just, every so often I'll get an idea and I'll think, you know something, I'm really fed up with the fact that African poets are nowhere on the literary landscape and um, got to do something about it. You know what, I'm gonna set up a prize. And I did, and it's, that was, that was um, 10 years ago. And you know, lots of African poets have come through as a result of it. And it's incredibly, the other thing about this kind of activism is it's very concrete. <clears throat> <clears throat> delivers results but it's also incredibly rewarding for me to know that I've been behind this um, it's good for my ego you know I wouldn't want anyone thinking that as an activist I'm some kind of saintly figure because I'm not I'm, I'm as human as anybody else um, and I love that I have this body of work that is about my activism and I love the fact that there are lots of writers out there who have come through the schemes that I've set up um, and it, it nourishes my ego. It really does. But also, it also, I, I know that I also made a change and that I was somebody, I am somebody who campaigns for equal opportunities in, in literature and inclusivity and diversity and all those, all those, um, you know, buzzwords. Right. So, um, and, and like bringing books back from the past, which is what I've been doing with my publisher at Penguin you know, six novels were brought back um, last year. The oldest title is by C.L.R. James, Minty Alley, published in 1936, Black British Books. And it came and went, nobody, nobody even remembers it. He became quite a figure, but nobody remembers he wrote this novel. And then we have five nonfiction books coming out in February this year. And one of them, which I'm so excited about, is called A Black Boy at Eton. And he was uh, the first black boy to graduate from Eton. A wow. couple of years after he graduated. Yeah, a couple of years after he graduated, he wrote this memoir and he called it A Nigger at Eton. We had to change the title, obvious reasons. Um, and he was, he was absolutely um, 
um, you know, trashed by the media for daring to write this memoir. Wow. And it's a brilliant memoir. It's so well written. And the headmaster at Eton told him he, could, he, was, he was not welcome there again. You know, he graduated, but he was never to darken their doors again. And it was published in 72. And we're bringing it out um, in, in a few weeks time. And it's such a good book. So, you know, it, it, it brings me a lot of joy to be able to be in this position to, to revisit literary history and bring back those books that didn't get, most of them did not get serious attention when they were first published. They, they have disappeared from sight. Nobody knows about black British literary history in this country. The young, most of the young writers coming through don't know who, who was publishing 10 years ago, let alone 100 years ago. And so this is part of a, um, you know, an attempt by me to, to yeah, to, to um, refresh our literary history and bring, bring these books to a much more receptive 21st century readership. Well, we've come to the end of our hour in Bernadine. and I can't thank you enough for being in the world and for what you're bringing into the world through your own work, through the works of others. Um, you're leaving the world changed um, through what you're doing, through manifesto, giving others encouragement. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm a massive fan. It has been an honor to spend this time with you. And hopefully you will finally make it to our shores. COVID will go away yeah. and I'll get an opportunity to meet you in person. Yes, yes. And thank you. This has been an absolutely fantastic interview. Absolutely fantastic questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. And thank you to the audience for being with us. We appreciate and you so much. Thanks to the audience. Keep writing. And thanks to the library as well. Thank you. Yes. Have a go to bed. Yes, it's half past, <laughs> it's 20 to 2 in the morning. <laughs> okay, bye everybody. Thank you again.